Hello and welcome to the Adulting Well podcast. I am your co-host Joshua and I am joined as always by the extraordinary Kevin, your co-host. And tonight we have Hannah Shaw on the show, uh, also known as the Kitten Lady. Um, And, you know, honestly, we could probably take up the whole show just with your bio, but you are a kitten rescuer, humane educator, also a best-selling author. Um, One of the things that I found really amazing beyond the fact that you do all these YouTube videos and guest appearances, speaking, you've toured, um, is also that you started your own nonprofit. Um, it's just really, I'm, and I'm quite honestly, like the only reason I'm listing these out is I'm wondering how in the heck you have time to even come on our show because you (laughs) have so much stuff going on and it's really amazing. So, yeah. So thanks for coming on. I, you know, quite honestly, normally what the first thing we ask is about, you know, kind of people's relationship to music, but I'm really curious about how you got into cat rescue and especially kittens. And I've, I have a cat. I have a kitten that we oh, great. we adopted from a shelter here. She's a, her mom was feral, and um and uh, so I've been watching some of your videos uh, to kind of. Can get we some go pointers. back even further? I'm curious, like when you were a little kid, if you had that same connection, or if it came later in life. Sure. Well, okay. So there's a lot going on there. So first of all, thank you for having me, and the answer to your earlier question is I don't have a lot of time, but I was super excited to get this request because I usually talk just to like cat people. And I was like, Oh, this is cool. This is unique. And it's, uh, it's awesome to be here. So I appreciate it. Um, thank you. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, how did I get started all this? Well, I, I grew up in New York city. I didn't have animals growing up. Um, I like loved, in an apartment or something. Yeah, I, ha- I had an apartment in New York City um, as a kid. We did not, we weren't like a big animal family. But um, honestly, the work I do now, I think, really started with like the decision to stop eating animals as a kid. Right. I just, you know, once I was old enough to have an opinion about anything, the first opinion I had was that it was not cool to eat animals. How old were and, you? I was 12 when I started being vegetarian. Wow. Did something happen or did you just go, whoa, this is wrong? Yeah. So I was 12 years old. I was at like a um, state fair and I had never been to one because I grew up in Manhattan and didn't see agricultural stuff right. ever. Right. Um, but I was, um, I was in another state. I got the opportunity to go to a state fair. I was really excited. I wanted to see all the farm animals because I had never seen them and I saw this mama pig and her piglet oh, geez. and there was a piglet who was hurt and it just made me very upset and I remember I went to try to find an adult to say hey there's a piglet who's hurt and they laughed at me and they said well you eat bacon don't you and I did but I never did again after that um so that moment like really set into motion a lot for me. I don't think I even realized how much it would. Um, I became really passionate about being vegetarian as a kid. I was like, I'm a vegetarian. And that's like, you know, my identity as like a 12, 13, 14 year old. And then, um, when I was 15, I went to, um, a festival, Mac rock. I don't know if you guys know Mac rock. Um, music festival on the, um, in Virginia. And I, I went to that festival and there was a table there from PETA. And I was like really excited. Cause I was like, Oh yeah, I'm a vegetarian. And I remember I walked up, I was like, Oh, I'm a vegetarian. And they said, cool. Have you ever thought about being vegan? And I was like, what? Huh? I don't even know <laughs> what that is. Like, I didn't know anything about that. I didn't even have friends who cared about animals. Um, they handed me a pamphlet that said like 50 reasons you should be vegan. And I have been vegan ever since that was more than half my life ago. Um, so my like early experiences in advocacy were all about farm animals and animals in laboratories. Um, I did a lot of activism as a high school student, as a college student, and I never was involved with um, cat welfare because I just always thought, okay, if, if chickens and pigs and cows have it this bad, why would anybody be focusing on cats? You know, they, everybody loves cats. Uh, when you say activism, do you mean just 
going to protests and stuff? Or are you throwing red paint on people? Like, wh- <laughs> how, how are we, how hardcore are we going? Uh, well, if I was, I wouldn't say so. Oh, sure, um, sure, sure. No, <laughs> um, no I, I was very involved in like, yeah, I went to a lot of protests. I like yeah. organized demonstrations in college sure, sure. against the circus and stuff like that. I was That's very, cool. I was very active, in, especially in college, um, against the circus against laboratories i mean that was my that was my life that was all of my life and then after i graduated college um, i moved to philly and when i was living in philly i uh was there a reason you went to philly it's cheap Uh, (laughs) a lot of people moved to philly i think after uh, a lot of people on the east coast you know it's like i was like 20 years old i was like well what do you do when you're 20 and you just graduated college you go to philly yeah Yeah, i lived in south philly in like a tiny house with a bunch of other people in it and i think i paid 130 dollars a month rent which is so dope um it's amazing yeah uh and then You know, when I was living in Philly, I found my first kitten. And that kitten is actually, she's still with me. She's right here, Coco. Um, And that, that was another like big turning point for me. So the, the long answer for how am I doing what I'm doing now is I found a kitten in a tree when I was like 21 years old. And um, I knew I wanted to help, but I didn't know what to do. I borrowed a stranger's shoes and climbed the tree because I was wearing flip flops. <laughs> I climbed the tree, put the kitten in my shirt, came back down the tree, and then was like, "Oh no, what do I do now? Like, right. I have no idea what to do." So um, that was a, a pivotal point for me because I, I learned really quickly that actually kittens, um, specifically like young orphaned neonatal kittens, they don't, at, you know, at the time, 10 years, 11 years ago, they really did not have good outcomes in shelters. Um, right. They pretty much were guaranteed to be euthanized in a shelter because mm. they don't have overnight staff there to take care of these kittens. They don't have the training, the tools, the supplies, the, um, you know, just the power, manpower to be caring for these, you know, vulnerable young kittens. So, I figured out that I was going to have to do it myself. And then a couple weeks later, I found another kitten outside. Oh, <laughs> Philly used to just have like kittens just springing up out of nowhere. It was like, uh, once my eyes opened, you couldn't close them again. There, There's just kittens everywhere. So right. I, I sort of became like the neighborhood kitten lady. And that was how I got the nickname kitten lady. Cause people would say, <laughs> Oh, you're like a cat lady. And I was like, I'm not really a cat lady. I'm like a kitten lady. You know, you call me when you find a kitten. Totally. So yeah, that was 11 years ago. And then I've spent the last decade plus um, working with neonatal kittens and trying to make it a safer world for them, help other people learn how to do what I do so that I don't have to do it alone. And so that no matter where in the world you are, if you find a kitten, you know what to do to help. Yeah. Oh my well, gosh, I, so, cool. so having, having watched some of your videos and having a young now, you know, she's She's not neonatal for sure. I mean, she's, you know, we've had her for almost six months now, but what's like, neonatal? just like, like the young neonatal is like a newborn. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like I watched the rocking video for like kittens of feral moms and it, mm. just like some of those little tips just help so much. I mean, you know, mm. she's, I mean, we, we obviously had the resources to help cause we, we adopted this cat and we, you know, but it was, it was really great. It was such an awesome experience too, because the shelter or the rescue that we adopted from is so small, you know? Mm. And so, you know, every little bit of donation helps. They have a great deal with a local vet. So getting the cat spayed or neutered is like reasonable, but it was, it was nice to have like a resource to go to. And so when I was fumbling over the, your moniker earlier, my son is like obsessed on Batman right now. Obsessed. And he calls his his mom, my, my wife, kitty woman, cat woman, kitty girl. So I'm like, I have all these different kitten and cat names in my head <laughs> right now um, because he's just like, that's all he does. Like he wants us to dress up with him <laughs> and he's really, so essentially we've got, you know, a, a three-year-old and a kitten in the house. And so it's been making for some interesting, you know, <laughs> confrontations in the house because uh, the cat, the cat, cat is the boss for sure. Um, sure. yeah. So she's chasing the dogs and, you know, we've got like an, actually like a really big dog and she's already like, 
she everyone knows that she's the alpha. So um, uh, it, and it yeah. didn't, did not take long. Were your parents vegetarian? Did you have like any influence at home around that? Just out of curiosity? My, my family thought that I was crazy when I told them <laughs> I was going to stop eating meat. And I'll tell you a funny story. When I was a, I was just such a little angsty, bratty teenager. And I used to leave my mom notes in the fridge from the dead animals in the oh, fridge. No. <laughs> and my mom would say like, I'm going to ban you from the kitchen. And I'd be like, you can't ban me from the kitchen. Like you have to feed me. I'm just like a teenager, you know? So I was, yeah, that, that was, that was my mom's relationship with my veganism. But what's funny is all these years later, guess who's vegan? My mom. Oh, that's uh, amazing. So she's super into it now. And I remember she used to like pick, little bits of tofu out of stuff that I was eating and be like, oh, Ew, so like I'm not eating this. And now she's like, Hey, like, can you recommend a good vegan feta? And I'm like, I can't believe like how far we've come. Like that's amazing. No one was talking about vegan feta when I was a teenager. You couldn't even get like soy milk at the store. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Now Safeway's uh, got like a vegan section. It's kind of weird. I know. It's, it's often, incredible. It's so that first couple and- months when you were getting cats though, can we just to go back to that? I, you rescue one. Joshua loves then- cats. And that I do. And then your neighbor, your neighbor's like, I found one. You're like, okay, thanks. And then Jim up the street found one. You have three now. At some point, you had too many, right? And had to figure out what to do with all these cats. Or no, so I, I, so this is Coco. You can see her right here. Hi, Coco. She's 11 now. So this nah. is the one who was in the tree. Mm-hmm. I mean, who knows what, what she was doing that. there, but she changed my life. Um, so. Yeah. So Coco, I brought down from the tree, brought her home, raised her, and then was of course like, okay, this is my cat now. Um, but all of, after that, all of the other kittens that I found, I was like, I, I, I'm a very, uh, reasonable person when it comes to this stuff. And I know my limits and I'm not, I'm not a collector of cats by any means. So, Mm -hmm. um, I got Coco and then I, um, fostered everybody else, found them homes, um, you know, it started with friends, like just, mm-hmm. Hey, who wants a kitten? You know? And then once I exhausted my friends, then it's like the circle is ever growing and friends of friends and colleagues and, you know, then starting to reach out into the community. And then I kind of, you know, was learning how to do adoptions. And of course now I do dozens and dozens of adoptions a year of my kittens. Um, and it's typically to just members of the public who are applying, um, so yeah, I, I, I definitely was not a collector of cats and still am not the, the like thing that I'm known for saying about fostering is goodbye is the goal. Mm-hmm. Goodbye is like yeah. the entire point of fostering. And if you're not saying goodbye, then you're not doing fostering correctly. Um, mm-hmm. you know, so the way that I see it is like, my goal is to save as many lives as possible while I'm on earth. And I know that's, you know, a limited amount of time. So I want to get them in, get them healthy and get them out. Um, and you know, with the, with the groups that I choose to focus on, I focus on the kittens who are the least likely to, um, have a positive outcome elsewhere. So I work with the most young, typically when a kitten comes here, they're one, two, three days old. Um, or I work with like special needs, um, kittens can, who have, you know, health conditions, Mm -hmm. um, congenital issues, things like that. So my goal the entire time is to get them to a place where they're independent enough to not need me. And then once they reach that point, I'm like, okay, guys, like, it was really nice having you here. Now get out of my house, you know? (laughs) Um, So that's, that's my attitude. Of course, I love all my babies. I want them to have great lives. But I have, I have no delusion that I'm the person who, you know, needs to keep all of them. I mean, if I'd kept every kitten that I've ever raised, I'd have probably close to a 1000 cats. Yeah, Um, that's, uh, that's a lot of cats. So yeah, I I I I struggle a bit with one. So I can't imagine. Yeah, I and mean, they're just you know they're such they're they have huge personalities for such tiny little animals you know. And yeah, and just, you can make a huge impact by fostering. I mean, you can foster yeah. even for two weeks and save someone's life, and you know it costs you nothing—a little bit of time, yeah. um, you know, a cool experience. You cool. grow so much from fostering. My entire worldview is informed by like the experiences that I have through fostering. So, yeah. Um, it's a, it's a beautiful gift to give an animal. 
So rolling back to when you, you went to that music festival, PETA was there. And I've actually worked PETA tables at those festivals before. So <laughs> yeah. my, my company used to print PETA's, like, especially PETA 2 merchandise for those oh. giveaways years ago. And um, th- those tables were incredibly impactful. And mm-hmm. But I've also noticed, especially the PETA 2 people back then, um, probably when you met them, were really involved in, like, a lot of, like, you know, punk they were there they had a lot of like people that were in bands that supported sure. what they were doing and um so talk a little bit about your experience with music as well because the way that i found out about you quite honestly was my um hr person at work uh came to work wearing one of the salt girl shirts that you put out oh, and cool. we, we print the jawbreaker stuff so i was like yeah hey, and Uh-oh. she was <laughs> no, well, she thought it was really funny. She was like, look at what I've got. And she had gone to see you speak like in San Jose or something um, okay. a couple of years ago. So I was like, wait a minute. So she was like, you have to check her out. She's like, she seems like she's probably like an old punk kid, you know, like, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, well with that shirt, I would assume. And then I saw that you yeah. actually referenced Jawbreaker on the website. So talk a little bit about how sort of that fit in as well, because a lot of people, that's where I learned about veganism. Um, was from playing in punk bands and I ended up in bands that, that like passed out PETA, you know, yeah. kind of uh, their, their, their materials. So. Oh my gosh. Well, I think as a young person, it was, it's hard to know. It's like a chicken and the egg thing. Right. right? Cause I know a lot of people who came to um, veganism and even straight edge, like through music. And I always kind of felt like it was like, I had these, I had these values and I had these kind of things about me as a, as a kid before I knew anything, you know, back when I was listening to Backstreet Boys. Um, (laughs) And then I got into punk music and then I found, I think that like the reason that I stayed there was because I found community that had the same values that I had and that helped me even better align my values. Like for instance, going to that festival and learning about veganism, like I was there because I, you know, wanted to see some bands play. And then I left with a completely different direction in life, you know? And, um, I think, yeah, I mean, it's undeniable that, 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 um, you know, being part of the punk community and having those, like those, um, morals and those values is like completely intertwined as a young person. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, I, I remember PETA, I, my first job in animal welfare was at PETA, um, yeah. going around to like festivals and stuff and like trying to get people to sign up on petitions and just trying to like get people to realize that it's like cool to be compassionate to animals. Yeah. Um, and I think they did a great job at that. I mean, of course they really are terrible with cat issues. Um, yeah, so now I'm, I'm not a friend of PETA now. I wish that they would kind of come into the modern day on um, cat issues, but they were definitely, you know, that was a formative part of yeah. my well, teenage Well, a years. lot of the people I knew that worked for them left, you know, like soon after we stopped printing for them. And I, I think because mm-hmm. they went a little more corporate, which is, you know, that's one part of it. But, you know, I agree. I think that they really kind of like, kind of fell in love with their own personality to some degree and started yeah. forgetting about other areas where they could improve. And that happens for a lot of nonprofits when you have leadership that's around forever, you know, and oh my I, gosh. Think, I think it's really interesting, you know, and I, you know, there's a lot of animal rights groups out here that I have difficulty with as well. And I feel like I'm like the elder statesman at this point, you know, I've been a vegan for forever. I mean, like we're talking like 30 years and, yeah. and um, you know, when I kind of run into some of this stuff, that's a little more aggressive and, you know, and I don't think, you know, and it's, uh, and I'll take a, a page out of the interview we did with Ian McKay, you know, I don't think we have to scream in people's faces to be loud and, and like, you know, sort of, you know, let people know there's nothing wrong with, with like delivering your message in a quieter way, as long as it's like informative and, you know, you know what you're talking about and you can give people information rather than have to argue with them. I spent a ton of time arguing with my parents as a kid about it and they, they really softened. They saw that it wasn't a phase, you know, and they really softened over the years about it. It kind of sounds like your mom went total 360, but you know, (laughs) 180, 
you know, but yeah. you know, I, I think it's interesting that, you know, when nonprofits have the same leadership for so long, it just really, it gets a little stale, unfortunately, you know, I have to say like as a nonprofit founder, that's like a huge fear for me because mm-hmm. I have seen so many, you know, and I've worked with a lot of nonprofits, both like for and with nonprofits, big, you know, national and international ones. And I've seen a lot and Honestly, um, working for big nonprofits has taught me exactly the kind of person I don't want to be. Um, it's taught me a lot about the importance of kind of like operating with a, uh, more like collective style spirit rather Mm -hmm. than like, you know, I'm the boss and this is how it goes because, (laughs) uh, you know, it just, it doesn't tend to work out too well, especially for, like you say, those, those longer lasting nonprofits that have the same leadership they had 45 years ago. Um, you know, I'm sure we could both, I'm sure we could both name a bunch of them. um, (laughs) Uh, yeah. I've worked for a few too. Yeah. And I've been on the board of a few. It's just a, it's difficult because you want to honor the founders, you know, but it's like also think times and things change and people's understanding of the issues change, you know? And I think, I think animal welfare is a, is a really great example of that. And, you know, out here we've got the, and you're, you're on the West coast now, right? Yeah. I live in San Diego. So the, the DXE movement is super in your face. And when I was younger, we used to try that and we ended up, we ended up getting choked out by cops and, you know, there was no, there was no like live stream back then. You know what I mean? There wasn't Facebook. So we weren't like, Hey, look at this cop is abusing us in Berkeley in front of the animal lab. No, by the time we could even take a photo, we would be laying on the ground. You know, it was not sure. like it is now. And I just think, you know, there's some sort, some middle ground that can be found around delivering the message, being, you know, being loud about it, of course, like, Hey, this is really important to me and it should be important to you for these reasons, but without sort of infringing on other people's rights, you know, and that's kind of where I'm, I'm, you know, I kind of like, uh, you know, I get a little, you know, cause it's uncomfortable to watch too at times. And I'm like, I dealt <laughs> with the dis- discomfort of watching, you know, meet your meat for the first time. Right. Sure. And, and things like that. Like I, I totally understand wanting to be aggressive about that stuff, but you know, it's just, it's really interesting because there's like this kind of new, version of that already happening where people are sort of like holding on to leadership within organizations. And it's like, well, you could use a little bit of help around Mm. how to sort of deliver this message in a different way. But yeah, I really agree with you on a lot of what you just said. And I think that like a lesson for me is that, you know, when I was doing a lot of the tactics, like, you know, screaming and getting in people's faces and leaving my mom notes from dead animals in her (laughs) fridge, like that, that, does not change hearts and minds. Um, and you know, if you look at the work that I do now, I, I like to think that I do incredibly impactful work, but I do it really in a, you know, a very cheerful (laughs) kind of way. I agree with that. Um, And that's part of like our whole goal with this podcast is to talk to people that are doing cool stuff. That's inspirational, but especially given the fact that California looks like the apocalypse right now, do it in a way that's positive, you know? So yeah. that was one one thing I, I wanted to I, I wanted to kind of drill down on. You you mentioned it, so you you brought it into the conversation. The the, the orphan kitty club kitten club um, is. I mean, when I saw that you had also started a nonprofit, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like you're doing videos almost every day. You've got when things are normal, you're speaking. You're you're doing your own fostering. Um, you know. I know you've got a lot of support at home. Your partner is obviously incredibly supportive of what you do do, and also does some really amazing work on the sort of document side of what you're doing Mm -hmm. to show everybody Mm -hmm. in terms of photographs. And, you know, and of course you can give him a shout out because he's an amazing person as well. But um, like that, that nonprofit. So I read through all the programs and, you know, I mean, it really feels like something that is sustainable and also possibly like, you know, you can expand it into other areas that you're not necessarily in because the way that it's set up feels very, very sort of like made for growth, you know? Mm, And so, you know, and I, like I said, I've been doing this a long time. I've been in nonprofit and social enterprise for 20 years on top of the fact that I've been vegan for so long, but like, I'd like to hear sort of maybe some of your plans around that specific project because it is so interesting and it's incredibly impactful. We're talking about thousands of cats lives that you're saving with that organization, Mm -hmm. you know, and you've got an awesome support team. Amazing. You know, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a huge part is like, 
getting your people together is huge. Um, you know, we have an awesome team and um, my nonprofit is, it's not just me, you know, it's me, it's Andrew, my partner who does incredible work. It's Sonia, who's um, our operations director. And she's like, you know, full-time, beyond full-time thinking about this stuff. And um, we just hired a new um, program uh, assistant who is awesome doing great stuff. And then obviously our board and we have an advisory board. So there's a lot of people who come together to make it happen. Um, but yeah, I mean the, the, the nonprofit, it, I had to start a nonprofit because the, the fortunate situation I'm in is that I have a lot of eyes on what I'm doing, um, which was a total accident and, uh, an absolute, um, Thing that I'm, I'm so grateful for every single day. I'm grateful to have the audience that I have and their uh, belief in what I'm doing because the support of just people on the internet who see what I'm doing and want to support it is um, genuinely transforming an entire system across the nation because we're able to, um, you know, take take the funding that comes in and distribute it out to our programs, which are not just taking care of kittens in my house, you know, that's the smallest thing that we do, honestly. And I think sometimes people don't realize everything that we do. I'm so like, pleased that you went on the website because, you know, the, the thing that everybody knows me for is having a nursery in my home where I take care of right. baby kittens and that's great. And that's what people come to me to support. But, you know, when you support that, what you're actually supporting the majority of what we do here in San Diego is TNR. Like we are on the street every week with huge teams of trappers getting all of the cats in our entire community sterilized. Like that's a huge thing that we do. Um, and then the other major, major thing we do is our grant program. Right. Um, and the grant program that, you know, when you talk about growth, that's it for me because I, you know, like I said, I'm not going to be on this earth forever. And I would love to, um, know that I'm creating something that can go on forever, you know, for as long as people will carry it. And, um, that's the Mighty Cat program. So the Mighty Cat program is our grant program. We started about um, almost two years ago. We've given away over three hundred thousand dollars so far. We are on track to try to double that by the end of the year. Nice. Um, which is we have our our grant cycle is open right now. So um, what we do is we partner with organizations all across the United States. Um, these are some of them very small orgs. Some of them are city shelters. Some of them are rural shelters. Um, we just got a group in Puerto Rico that I'm really excited about that's joined us. Um, so we're trying to be in every U.S. territory, um, making it a safer country for cats and for kittens specifically. Nice. Um, our program is the it's the first and only grant program in the world that specifically targets um, funding for neonatal kittens. Um, so we help fund things like helping shelters build a nursery, helping oh, cool. um, foster-based organizations to get all the supplies they need so that when they recruit fosters, they can actually send them home with food and blankets and play pens and all the stuff that they need. You know, that's, to me, that's the most powerful thing that we can do because, you know, like I said, I can't do everything here in right. my house. I, you know, I have limited yeah, time in it's the not. day. And so, but what I can do hopefully is inspire people to give to a program that they can then see transparently. We are, we are doing the maximum amount of good with those funds. Um, right. so that's what it's all about for me. And going back to what we were talking about, I learned a lot of what I didn't want to do from working for much bigger right. organizations than mine. And a big goal for me is not to grow to a big organization. I never want to have an office. I never want to have like a hierarchical staff. Um, I don't want to ever have to like even put on pants to go to work. You know, <laughs> I want to be able to like anything we do, any decision we make should be able to be made on my couch in sweatpants. And, totally. you know, we, and we take the, the support that comes in and we distribute it. Nice. Well, and I think the, that that's, it's such an obvious way to grow if you don't want that other kind of version of the nonprofit, because yeah. essentially you're just, all you're doing is you're, you're taking the money and you're distributing it. So you don't need a huge staff to do that because you're not making, you're not building your own shelters. You're not building your own rescues. You're just like, okay, who apply? Because we got some money right now. 
Who needs mm-hmm. it? And what are you going to do? Yeah, with it we're exactly? enabling other people yeah. to do good, and we see it as an investment in the future of kitten welfare in this country. Like we invest in organizations whose missions align with ours, who we can see are doing good work. There is, um, you know, a process for becoming a partner org with us. Right, of course. Uh, it's not just anybody can apply. We have right. to make sure that you have, you know, not just that you're like a sound organization, but also that you know, your principles align with ours. Cause there are some organizations, like you were saying about people kind of being very aggressive and negative. We specifically do not partner with organizations that kind of have a lot of the like really sad in your face stuff. Um, just right. because we don't, that's not aligned with us. We look for organizations that are going to be bringing animal welfare to where it needs to be. And we help them um, you know, hopefully do that. And so in that way, we're able to be pretty influential, I think, um, in kind of the direction that things go, at least as for, as far as kittens are concerned. Yeah. Um, so it's cool. It's a really cool thing. And, and the, you're right, you know, there's no upper limit now to how much support we could take in. And, and before, when I started this nonprofit, it was very, it was extremely overwhelming to me when we would right. get a large donation because I was like, Oh no, Oh no. Like, right. what do I do with this? You know, it's like, we don't want to hold on to this too long. <laughs> no, it's a huge yeah. responsibility. And you're dealing potentially with, um, people who are, you know, giving you gifts as part of their wedding or giving you right. gifts as part of like a bereavement. And it's like, I've seen too much from other nonprofits to, to do that in the wrong way. Like we're totally. doing that in the right way. And we are very, very serious about that. So, um, well, and the lower really you keep your now. overhead, right. The lower you yeah. keep your overhead, the more money there is to give. If you're not having exactly. to pay a giant staff, rent real estate, do all yeah. those things that kind of come along with that and increase the admin costs of running the organization. And if you're really making decisions based on like a set of principles that you've all agreed on, and you've got mm-hmm. an advisory board that's got your back. I mean, the, the, these are the kinds of organizations that are going to last because you can also pivot that as sort of new information comes in. You can say, oh, yeah. well, now we're going to give money to these kinds of, of organizations sure. as well, you know, that are funding like sources for a group of smaller rescues or shelters. And it's just like. Yeah. We're very nimble. And yeah. that's important to me because. um I've never had a, a more difficult boss than myself. You know, I'm, I'm extremely like driven and dedicated to this work. Um, but what's important to me is that, you know, where, where I've struggled in other jobs is that when I see an opportunity, if there's too much bureaucracy to be able to take the opportunity, cause too many people's, you know, so many cooks in the kitchen, I'm like, listen, if we have an opportunity to do something good, let's do it. So that's the kind of org that we are is we're, we are, you know, a very, we're a small, but we're an incredibly impactful organization of a couple of people who can be nimble together enough to kind of navigate, you know, when coronavirus hit, we were like, okay, this is going to impact shelters big time. What's going to happen? Well, Shelters are going to have to get everyone out into foster because they're not going to be able to have as much staff on site. So what can we do? Let's do a coronavirus emergency grant cycle where we just give foster supplies to people. And we gave over $60,000 in grants to shelters just to get, um, you know, their their supplies for their emergency fosters. And we were able to do that in like the blink of an eye because it was because we're small, you know? Yeah. So talk a little bit too. I mean, I know that, so you, you wear a lot of different hats, obviously you're, you know, founder and you run the nonprofit, but one of the big things that you were doing for a long time, and this is the other kind of like line that I was drawing kind of, you know, along parallel with music is you were on the road. I mean, you went out Mm -hmm. and like supported your book, supported your YouTube videos, your kind of your, and it seems like almost like part of your, your, you know, your, your personality and your abilities suit talking in front of people. And, you know, I don't ever assume anyone's like comfortable with that because it's, (laughs) I've done a lot of it too. And it not nearly at the level you have, but it's, it's nerve wracking. Like speaking to a few hundred people in a giant auditorium is can, you know, I don't care how good you are at it. It's nerve wracking, but it's something that obviously you've not only honed your skills at, but you've taken on as part of your responsibility. And so talk a little bit about the education part of what you're doing, because I think that was one of the biggest parts kind of before this wave that you're, that you're on came about was lacking around 
you know, especially kittens, but cat rescue in general. I mean, sure. there was sort of this like, you know, what do I do? You know, and there was just yeah. no like real clear, like educational materials to kind of, you know, show your family and your kids. And, you know, this is how we treat our cats and this is how we keep them healthy. You know, the, the stuff just mm -hmm. didn't quite honestly, it just didn't really exist in a really accessible way. Yeah. So, um, you are correct that when we're not in the middle of a global pandemic, um, my main my main job is traveling around and teaching people how to take care of kittens and also how to, um, you know, I train animal shelters um, in how to run um, life saving programs for cats. So I have you know specific trainings for animal control officers for. Um, you know, shelter administrators, for volunteers, for people who are involved in community cats. And that is, um, that's my main thing that I usually do. How long um, do you go out on the road for at a time? You know, it depends. Um, sometimes I'm booked just for like a weekend and I go out, you know, I fly one place and then drive to another place and then come home. Um, the last one that I did before uh, the pandemic hit was, I think I did six in like eight days or something like that. Do you like being um, on the road? I love it. Really? I miss it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've honestly, I've kind of always been a person who does travel for work for, and for fun. Um, I'm a huge traveler. Um, and I, I've, I've never really until recently, until moving to San Diego, I never really felt like I was doing that much local work. Like I kind of always did more national in scope type work. Um, so it's nice because now I feel like I, I do a bit of both and it's definitely nice to have the local programs now. I mean, I, I can't hardly leave my house these days. So it, the opportunity to get to go trap cats is like, wow, that's exciting now. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Cause it's like, I barely get out. I'm like, Ooh, we're trapping today. Yeah. What happens? You get a, the, the bat phone rings and someone says there's a kitten in a tree and then you go out. <laughs> just... No. So we, that would um, be the kitten phone, sir. Kitten phone, the kitten yeah. phone. <laughs> with our, with our trapping program. I mean, we, what we do is when we get a kitten in, we get the address where the kitten's from and then we go out and we trap. Um, so we have like a big team of trappers of people who decide which ones they want to be involved in. Um, and we pick a colony that we're going to kind of be in charge of. And then we just go and trap and it's super fun. But yeah, I miss events a lot. Um, I also, there's a huge cat convention scene. I know that sounds probably oh, like, I, whoa, what? No, no, no. I, um, the the same HR person that had your t-shirt goes to the cat conventions. Sure, She's all yeah, about so it. That's like, I mean, I did, I think I did like 12 cat conventions or something last year. Um, so I'm, I'm very involved in all of that. And, you know, I think something that's unique about me in terms of being part of the cat world is most cat people are more introverted. Yes. Um, and I am extremely extroverted and I love being, I love teaching. Like I love the opportunity to speak to a large amount of people at once. Um, and to kind of like share my joy of what I do and then to be able to hopefully let that seep into other people and let them, you know, not just realize that maybe this is something they could do, but learn the skills, like the actual tangible skills to do it. Um, so that's a huge part of my life. Of course, I actually reach more people by being just online. Um, yeah. so, so much of my life now is just like, I'm an internet person. Content, content, <laughs> content. Content, well, content, content all day. The, yeah. I mean, and I think that's probably, you know, assisted in your success is because you're such an extrovert and people are like, oh my gosh, she's out actually talking about this stuff that we're super excited about, but can't express, you know, and yeah, I've so, I've seen some of your, you know, I try to do my research as best I can, given the fact that I'm, you know, full time at work, full time dad, like million different things going on as well. But, um, you know, I noticed some of the photos of the kids that have come to your events too. And I mean, how how fulfilling is that to have like a child like kind of like, oh my gosh, like I can actually help. Yeah, um, I love that. And I have some great kids that I've met who are growing up. I mean, this is what's cool about having done this specific project for, you know, about five years now, like, you know, this has been my life just traveling around teaching events, 
doing, you know, online content about kitten care. Um, I have like kids who were little who are now like teenagers who are like actually doing the stuff like they're yeah. out there doing the good work. And um, I love seeing that. I really love working with young people um, and helping them see that they can make a difference. Uh, I put out a kid's book last year called Kitten Lady's Big Book of Little Kittens. And <laughs> um, I did a, a tour for the kid's book and it was just awesome. It was so fun. And I did like kids only Q&A. So only kids could ask questions. Oh, awesome. and they have great questions and they're so engaged. And, you know, compassion comes really nat- uh, naturally to young people. I feel totally. like it's almost like we beat it out of them with a stick. The older yeah. you get, it's like, you know, but if you if you don't do that, if you like help kids embrace that from a young age, I mean, I wish that I was as involved as I am now when I was younger, you know? Yeah. Well, I have a, I have an almost 12 year old daughter who is by choice a vegan as well. Cool. Um, and is just like, she's like a cat whisperer, man. She's, we got one of the cats that we have here is, uh, she was actually, she was feral too. And she's not as sociable as the, is the, the younger one. She just does not want to talk to anybody. You know, she's <laughs> She's mm-hmm. like, but she loves my daughter. She'll like come yeah. out of her hiding place and like sit on her lap. And, you know, it's just like a very, uh, she's just got that kind of way about her. So I'm going to, I'm going to start throwing your materials at her. She'll probably become like a, uh, super fan. You'll see her liking your stuff on, on YouTube. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I, I recently did like a four part webinar series. That is what I'm recommending to yeah. everybody to watch now. If you're like looking for the crash course, of course, it's like an eight hour crash course. It's, yeah. it's, it's four parts. It's very in depth, but, uh, I, it's I was on your, just like, it's so, on your site, right? Yeah. It's yeah, kittenlady.org slash webinar. I, yeah. I was just so happy to have the opportunity to get to do that because it's like everything that you would learn coming to one of my events, you can, can kind of see on there for free at any given time that you'd like to, but I love feral cats. That's like my jam. I have a I really know. cool feral mom right now in my uh, nursery here in my house and nice. I get hissed at every day and it's great. Oh. Yeah. They're <laughs> <laughs> the moms are pretty serious business, man. They're like, uh, they don't mess around. <laughs> I respect feral cats. Cause it's like, if a human hasn't given you a reason to love them, then why should you like, totally. I kind of feel like I'm like semi feral. <laughs> so I get it. <laughs> yeah. So w- when, when you were doing, um, cause I remember like, you know, obviously doing protesting was always a, a thing when, what, what's kind of the roughest city you were in for that? Cause I, I mean, I'm in, I'm in Northern California where we've got some cow towns out here and we got, I mean, we got abused. I mean, we got like hot dogs thrown at us and oh, you know, wow. just like nasty stuff. So I have so many stories of like crazy and weird and sad protests. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> I mean, I, let's see. I mean, I got a concussion from a police officer when I was uh, oh, no. 19, I think at a protest. That oh. was not a fun story. Um, but then I have like, oh, I got wild stories, like, um, I'm trying to think of like a, a funny one that I can try. I just had one. Um, you know, we had, yeah, we would have people throw stuff at us. We would have, um, oh. mm, and I just had a funny thing that I was, oh, well, one time I was, uh, at a beach doing a protest with somebody who was wearing a chicken suit and a guy like came and tackled the person in the chicken suit because he thought it was a guy, which is like, who cares? Um, But he tackled, it was like this young girl in there. And then, you know, he ended up being feeling so bad and he was like, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. She was crying because she got really hurt. And then he was like, what can I do to like, make it better and we were like you can wear the chicken suit so we had to wear the chicken suit for the rest of the um, <laughs> protest and that was really funny um that's you know, amazing just, yeah that's actually weird. a fun protest story other than the girl <laughs> getting hurt obviously that's yeah amazing. no i mean i think it was that that made it um at least it turned it around into a fun thing but yeah people are nasty to protesters yeah, yeah very it's- much and i don't i don't um, get out there too much now. Honestly, no. I, I don't do a ton of protesting for a couple of reasons, primarily that I'm doing animal care right. around the clock, like including overnight. So it's just sure. hard for me to get out unless I'm like, you know, 
traveling and then I have somebody here helping, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, we've been going just to the local, like black lives matter protests and stuff yeah. like that. It's, it's so, it's so chill here. You know, it's like basically soccer moms and dads, you know, it's like, so wow. it's not, it's not like going even down to SF or Oakland, you know, it's just like sure. very relaxed here, but we noticed some, our big, our big like political activism was we went out last night and removed all the Trump stickers we could find around the. Around oh, town. nice. <laughs> Are there Trump stickers in Mill Valley? Not to believe it or not. Or- yeah. Mm. You'd be surprised, man. This is the, like, this is sort of like the, almost like it, it's a pretty conspiracy a Toriel town. Like it's the biggest anti-vax on the West coast. Oh, no. Yeah. No. So there's that whole thing. And then Don't do it's, that. yeah, it's so it's, it's very interesting, you know? So there's a lot of like, sort of like people that are super far left so far that they're almost like libertarian. And there's, you know, some actual like very wealthy people here because it's a wealthy town as well. And, you know, we're, we're sort of like, we're in like what was the old artist kind of area of town. And it's not, uh-huh. you know, it's a little more, it's it's mill valley ghetto i guess but it's not really that ghetto but yeah, um, i mean i i moved to california just two years ago and it's right. a totally different vibe here <laughs> welcome to I'm california to. Yeah. um yeah i know and now it's all on fire um yep. but how's uh, it going down there you know i i've never been this close to a wildfire before yeah. um and we i'm fostering some ducklings right now so that's the other thing is i do like babies right. of other species and so I have these foster ducklings right now who I have to take outside every day. Oh, they like live in my nursery, but they go outside to go and they have like a little dog pool that they love. Yeah. Like, and this is the best part of my day right now. Every day <laughs> is I do duck pool time. Um, and these, they go in the pool and I give them, you know, romaine and blueberries and they're like so happy and I'm so they happy. Eat blueberries? Oh my win, gosh. win, win. Oh, do they eat blue? They love blueberries. Like you would not believe. That is yeah. so funny. They love blueberries. Well, but I, I, I highly recommend there. watching the videos of the ducks. They're pretty amazing. Oh, yeah. They're so yeah, cute. Especially in slow motion. Like I never knew I needed duck <laughs> in slow motion so much until this month. But, um, but yeah, when I'm taking them outside now, it's like these huge just huge smoke everywhere and it's so yeah. like hazy and we're lucky to be kind of elevated like we're on a mountain so yeah. um a lot of the a lot of my friends who are more um like in like valley areas say that there's a lot of like ashes falling and stuff mm-hmm. like that but we haven't had any of that here we, yeah. it's just that the sky is so eerie looking mm-hmm. yeah yeah i mean it's intense so you talked about going out and doing like trapping cats and kittens and Mm -hmm. so i I watched the movie recently the cat rescuers cool my friend sassy is in that that is quite a movie i mean that like trapping cats especially adult cats is no joke like they are so smart yeah yeah it's a really fun i always say it's like hunting but nice yeah um you know, like I imagine, I think if I was the big jerk and wanted to kill animals that I would be an awesome hunter because I'm a great trapper. <laughs> um, That's interesting. I, I think it would be really fun to hunt, but I don't yeah. want to ever hunt. Right. No, Maybe. I feel the same way <laughs> yeah. um, because it's like, you know, you get to be outside. There's like sure. some camaraderie with your friends. Yeah, there's totally. like a little bit of a sneaky element, which yeah. is nice. You, you know? get to get like, like huddle over the track and be like, ah, I think this is. The, yeah, this exactly. Movie. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, Ooh, like there's a lot of like strategy involved. Uh-huh. And so it's a really fun thing to trap cats. And then the good thing is once you trap them, you know, like that you've just eliminated so much suffering because you're going to mm-hmm. get that cat neutered. They're not going to give birth to all these kittens who are entering the shelters. Because what people don't realize is the vast majority, and I'm talking like 90, 95% of kittens who come into shelters, they're not coming from people's homes. They're coming right. from outside. Mm. So when you trap a cat, that's the number one way to help kittens is by sterilizing the cats in your community. So it's just awesome. And when the trap goes off and you hear that little click sound, it's like, Ooh, it's like adrenaline <laughs> rush, all the good. It's vibes. a literal trap, a cat trap. With, yeah. Like, watch yeah. Joshua, watch the cat. Okay, rescuers. I'll watch. I'll I am watch. not yeah, even them. kidding. You get them in the trap and it's humane. I mean, it's nobody gets hurt. From sure, this, sure. Um, other than, you know, we take their balls from them. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, nobody nobody's getting harmed by these traps. They go in, they step on a little lever, the trap closes, you cover them with a blanket, you bring them in for surgery. Once they're, you know, 
bright and alert and they've recovered from the anesthesia, then you stick them back out and they continue living their lives without contributing to the population. But it is fun. It is really fun. That's like my, well, that I, I, and duck pool time are like the only fun I can have during this <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> well, I, will, I hope there's other things, but um, <laughs> the, um, there were some really interesting facts in that movie and it's things that I didn't know. My mm. wife who has had cats her entire life didn't know that like mm. they can get pregnant so quickly after giving birth. Yeah. I did not yeah. know that. And, and they have very short gestation periods, yeah. like 63 days. So yeah. think about how many times they can yeah. have a litter a year. Well, and I think that people that don't live in cities don't realize how big the feral cat population is. You know, if you're not in a neighborhood where there's a feral cat population, you're not even going to really know, you know, like if you live out in, you know, nowheresville, you might have a cat on out in the, you know, out in the property somewhere that, you know, that kind of comes and goes and, you know, but that's not, it's not the same thing at all. And the populations are just huge. I mean, mm -hmm. like that movie was a huge eye opener for me. I was just like, Oh my God. God, I can't believe that these many animals are suffering, especially yeah, somebody that's as educated as I am. If I didn't know, like, it's a definitely like a must watch movie, like just yeah. for the facts alone. That they, yeah. That they and I don't know if there. you remember Sassy Walker. She's mm -hmm. one of the people. Oh, in she's that amazing. Film. She's one of my friends who I, I just like respect her work so much because she's out there literally every day, like doing this work on the ground in New York. Um, yeah, I don't think people realize the because, you know, feral cats are good at um, not being seen if they don't want to be seen. So you might not even realize that your community has a lot of cats in it yep. um, until you find a kitten outside and you're like, oh, some bad person put this kitten here. And it's like, no, like, honestly, the good news is there's not that many bad people putting kittens outside. Right. The right. bad news is, you know, probably half of the cats in our entire country are community cats who are outside mm. who will not stop giving birth to more kittens and filling our shelters, you know, every two, three months uh, mm -hmm. with more kittens until we, you know, sterilize them. So that's why I'm so passionate about that. I mean, yeah. that's me. That's me. Yeah. My our, favorite. our, our little cats heading, heading to get spayed tomorrow. It's, it's oh, her, it's, congrats. It's time for her to, to get, surgery because we she wants to go outside really bad and we haven't been able to let her outside yet you know because mm. we don't we don't obviously want to contribute to the Definitely to the don't. kitten population yeah. but yeah. um so what's next i mean so i got like a couple closing questions i know we're really close to time and i want to honor that because i know you're you're obviously incredibly busy but so uh, you mentioned you're going to try to double up what you've done in the past with the with with the nonprofit and, and raise sounds like $600,000, which is amazing. And so you're going, trying to get that done by the end of 2020. We have our grant cycle is open right now and we're mm -hmm. hoping to do, um, we're hoping to do around $300,000 of grants by the end of the, like the starting cycle. from now to the end of um, the year. And we have a bunch of new organizations that we've onboarded. So okay. I, I, feel hopeful that we'll be able to do that as long as nice. we get some great proposals. Um, so that's what's next for, you know, for the nonprofit. Um, and how how you know, can people help? In yeah, terms I was going to say, we'll put a link up, but how, if donate sure. money, yeah. Yeah. It's orphanskittenclub.org slash donate. Um, you can become a member of our, of our little club, which is the best way to help because, you know, you make a monthly contribution. It could be $5. It could be $10, you know, and when you become a member, you get all sorts of like goodies. So you get like a cute nice. membership card with a kitten on it. You get a patch, you get a sticker. Um, and then every couple months we send out these like trading cards. They're kind of like baseball cards, but for kittens. Oh. And then we put like fake stats on there for the kittens. So <laughs> it'll be like, you know, you put like what league they're in. They're like in the neonate league. And then we'll put like, you know, most likely to be mistaken for a hamster or something like oh just God, silly, so yeah. silly stats. Um, beautiful photo, but it's just like a way of making sure people remember that we're grateful to them. And, you know, if you're donating monthly, we want you to know every couple months, like, Hey, we, we are appreciative of you because it's a big community effort. Yeah. Um, the other so, thing that I have coming up is I'm always writing. Um, yep. so I have, you know, in the, 
distant future um, writing projects that I'm working on now that I can't wait to share in the future. Very cool. Very cool. And who does your illustration for those? Well, um, I have, so my, my primary book is tiny, but mighty. Mm -hmm. That's my like 300 plus page guide to, um, saving kittens. And that is all photography. Um, it's half my photos, half Andrew's photos. Nice. Um, and then my children's book is also photos, um, with doodles, which were provided by the publisher. Excellent. Um, so I worked with Simon and Schuster and they made great doodles all over it. Um, oh. I'm working currently on another children's book and another book for adults. Um, and so I have not gotten to the stage yet where we've talked about art. Um, nice. But I'm really, I love writing so much. You it's, do, you do collaborations too on some of your like merchandise as well. Though, sure. Right? Yeah. So one of the artists who I love, um, she's one of my dear friends. Um, you should interview her. She would be great okay. on here. Um, she's another awesome, like vegan straight edge lady. Um, and, uh, her name is Megan Lynn Cott okay. and she, oh, I know is, her. you know her, she's up here, right? She's Isn't in, she um, Oakland? she's in, no, oh, uh, she was, yeah, yeah she was. She used to be in Oakland. Yeah. yeah. No, now she lives in Wisconsin, but arts um, community is yes. teeny tiny. Yes. So she does like great animal art and that's her I've full-time, seen her art her full-time gig, but she mainly does cat art. So we do a lot of collaborating together. Nice. Yeah. And she does, so she's done like drawings for your merchandise and stuff like she's that. She's done some of my merchandise. We're actually awesome. pitching something together right now that I can't talk about, but we <laughs> want, we really want to do more collaborating together. Cause I just adore her. She's, she's, She's one of the best people I've met through cat stuff, you know, because I nice. meet a lot of people in the cat world. And we have a lot in common in terms of cats. But when I met Megan, I was like, wait, we have like just all this stuff in common. Like right. she's, she's great. And she's a fantastic artist. Um, I'll, I'll definitely email her. Cause yeah. I have her. I and she think, does a lot of um, pins and stuff for podcasts. I totally talk to feel her. like she did something that we printed at one point, but I just, I don't know how we connected or maybe she was doing a show. I don't know. You know, it's, mm. there's like, it's just a, such a small world. Um, sure. Yeah. And having screen printed, you know, for most of my adult life as well, it just like stuff comes through, you know, you just see things and, but I know I'm, we're connected on social media somewhere. She's got some great stuff. This show could um, be called, instead of adulting well, it could be called Kevin's Rolodex. Yeah. Somewhat. <laughs> To, well, a lot of the people we interview, I know, which is, you know, just because I've, you know, I've been, come on, I've been touring and doing all this crap for way too long. And now I just get to do it from my home. You know, this is nice for me. <laughs> yeah. Get to walk out and, you know, eat some food. So, um, well, it's, it's nice when, you know, I think this is a really small community and, you know, yep. you always find that you have connections to people that you don't expect. And, Totally. Um, that's so funny that, you know, Megan, but yeah, she's another cat convention person. We're always awesome. at conventions together. Um, and just having fun and also being exhausted because it's like the most <laughs> exhausting thing in the world. Yeah. Um, conventions but I really, I time. miss, I miss being able to do all of that and see people IRL with people. Yeah. Interacting with people is amazing. Um, so we'll definitely post a link, get people to donate to the, to the organization. I mean, you obviously you. have a much further reach than we do, but there's probably people that listen to us that don't know who you are. Sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, and I think that for our, our fans that are, that are punk fans, check out the, the jawbreaker esque shirt. It's a really cool shirt. And the money I would assume goes back to the organization or to yeah, your and good it work. It says on it, when it rains, it purrs. Oh, <laughs> that's perfect. Um, and it's, we a, just, and it's, a lady like that's raining cats, but then yes. it's like a lady carrying a kennel. It's, it's it, cute. It's pretty cute. <laughs> it's pretty cute. Adam was just on the show last week and he actually got, you, you sent some to Chris or somebody, somebody in the band is connected. Oh, you in some way. Funny. And okay. so he has one of the shirts and he was like, ah. Because I was kind of joking with him about it. He's like, oh, man, no problem. I love that thing. It's an awesome shirt. Oh, good. I'm glad I'm not going to get a cease and desist. I appreciate no, that. No, not from that. Maybe, <laughs> maybe from Morton. <laughs> Although his they stopped was sending like, us to those a long time ago. If it sucks, basically, right? Was this? Yeah, his thing was if it's bad, if it's a bad knockoff that he gets pissed. If it's, if it's the a wrong good one, font. Or- <laughs> yeah. If it's a good one, he loves it. And then um, new, new content coming in terms of uh, other than – are you working on any other new instructional stuff? Cause the, that, four, that four video thing is awesome. I, yeah. for anybody that's going to adopt a cat 
or foster or be involved, especially with young kittens. It's totally like must see TV. You have to watch this. And even for people that have had animals their whole lives, you learn stuff, you know, and kind of watching and learning is again, what, what, what we're all about. We want to, we want to promote positive, positive action and positive change in the world. And you know, yeah. the way to do it is to connect, you know, continuing to connect communities, right? Yeah. So, so I always have videos coming out. I try to put one to two YouTube videos out every week, nice. which is like ugh, so much work. Yeah, um, right? I, yeah, everything so I do, work. I like write, film, edit, make the thumbnail for it on Photoshop. Like it mm-hmm. is a lot of work, but it's really fun. Um, and yeah, so I, I actually bizarrely have a bunch of stuff scheduled right now. Usually I'm doing everything like like, okay, I'm going to make it right now and then get it out right away. But I've been trying to get better about like giving myself some like lead time on stuff. So I have a couple, a couple, um, I mean, I have my interview series that I'm doing right now is called kitten lady and friends. I've been interviewing people from cat welfare world, which I'm really excited about. Um, I have two more episodes left on that. So it's just like an eight part series. Um, and then I have, I got like a new campaign that I'm working on um, to try to shut down a laboratory that's testing on cats um, horrifically that I'm going to post tomorrow, I think. Okay. Um, got a really cute compilation video of duckling fostering coming out. Uh, in a couple awesome. Days. So, I mean, I mostly I put I'm putting that out because. Not because it's going to teach anybody a lot. I don't have a ton of, I'm not an expert at all about ducklings, but it has been so right. fun to foster them. And I, I like putting that out into the world, especially because I think as a person who my primary audience is cat people, but if I right. can show cat people that like, Hey, by the way, you know, sometimes I foster piglets and sometimes I foster ducklings and these you animals are piglets. Oh yeah. That's oh, like my, my jam. Gosh. That's my jam. So and cute. But when you can help people see that they are every bit as personable, every bit as um, deserving of protection, a lot of people have kind of changed their ways of looking at farm animals, I think, through seeing me do it with kittens and then seeing me do it with a farm animal and realizing it's not any different at all. You know. Nice. Nice. Is there any other pro- – I mean, that's that's quite a list, but – Anything else you're working on that you want to share about? Uh, I'm always working on. I'm always working on a bunch of stuff. Um, I don't know if I can talk about some of it though. That's fair. Totally yeah. fair. Totally fair. Totally but fair. Let's just say I always have. I always have new stuff coming out. Yeah. Okay. Well, we like super appreciate. It. I know we're just like a small little podcast, and you've got a massive following, and it's a huge deal for us. Quite honestly, it was a big deal. When Ian oh. came on, it was a big deal. When when Matt Nathanson came on, we've got some some celebrities that love us for whatever reason. I mean, obviously Josh was adorable, but um, we really appreciate it. It's it, seriously, it's like a huge deal, and you know that kind of intertwining of like you know the punk community, uh, the vegan community, and just the amazing work that you're doing. And, and people and they, who stick to their guns since they were yeah. twelve, you know, it's part of it is just. <laughs> And my personal envy of people like that and, and wanting to, to learn how they tick. You know? yeah. Huh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the thing that I always say is like, find something that you love and do it long enough until you're the only one who can do it, you know? And that's how you make, that's how you make a career doing what you love is do it for free for your entire life until you're the only one who can do it. You know, I feel really fortunate that I've been able to, kind of like take a thing that I feel really passionately about and turn it into my entire life. Um, but that's, that is what it is. I think I fully believe that people can do that with anything that they care about. If it's a good thing worthy of support, mm-hmm. you'll find a way to get that support, even if it takes 10 years, you know? Yeah. Well, and you've proven it. And it's like, I think the, like, obviously we talked about a lot in this hour, but the fact that you have made such a strong impact. I, I find that it's the hardest to make impact on people that I'm the closest to. Mm. And to hear that story that your mom is now a vegan is like, so like, I am not even kidding. That's like, I was like, oh, it's oh my so gosh. lovely. Well, can I tell you though, how it happened? Yes. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Here's how it happened. I've been talking to my mom about veganism for what is it, 18 years now. Yeah. And she was so resistant, so resistant. Then 
maybe two, three years ago, I did a talk at a animal rights event. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, the talk was, I called it for the love of orphans and it's on YouTube. Um, I like filmed it specifically because I don't talk a lot about veganism on kitten lady stuff. Um, and anytime I have the opportunity to, I want to kind of like slip it in and like just help people understand where I'm coming from. So totally. I thought, okay, I'm going to film this, put it on YouTube. The talk was kind of the juxtaposition of loving and caring for these orphaned animals while, you know, if you're also participating in, um, you know, the consumption of milk, which mm -hmm. creates orphans like dairy. The dairy industry is an industry of creating orphans, yeah. orphaned calves. Yeah. So that was what my talk was about. And I um, kind of talked about how devastating it is that, you know, so many people don't know that they're creating these, they're taking, they're taking literally breast milk from a baby when you're consuming dairy products. And um, just, I, to me, dairy is the biggest that's the, the primary nightmare. Um, that's a real yeah. bummer to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a really, really sad thing. And so I, I tried to do it in that. a fun way where I told a story and then talked about, you know, so, yeah. so you can watch that. It's, it's called for, for the love of orphans. If you look on okay. YouTube, but my mom watched the video and then decided to be vegan. And oh, I was like, wow. I was like, you're deciding to be vegan from a YouTube video I made? Like, you could have just talked to me or, like, listened <laughs> at all in the last 18 years. Yeah, well. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you Amazing. Know, so. People get it when they get it. And you know what? The thing is, is, like, there's no doubt that – I don't have any doubt that being so adamantly, like – true to myself around it for all these years has affected people. And whether it's just the reduction of consumption of animal products, most of the time is good enough for me. Like mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm totally cool with that. And I, I really have come to a place in my life where I try not to judge. It's hard not to, you know, especially around environmentalists, but that's a whole nother story. And, mm -hmm. but I just like that, just hearing that. And also the, like the backstory is super heartwarming and it's not really necessarily you're saying it's because of the video, but the fact of the matter is she's watched you for 18 years, be who you are. And that's like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's how we really love each other. Like truly, like you watch somebody be who they are and you're like, I want to be like, like them. You know what I mean? Like it's really inspiring. So uh, yeah. these are the stories that we love here. And uh, so I really appreciate you, you, you staying on a little longer just to tell that one. Sure. So, yeah. Um, yeah thanks. Well, thank so, you for having me. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Yeah, um, my cat is meowing at me now. She's like, yeah, all right. My, I think mine's at the door along with my dog. My dog's scratching here, and my cat's meowing. She's, uh -huh. You can probably hear her. She's an internet star too, right? Coco is, you know, I mean, she's, she's. I think loved by a lot of people. C come is, along I, for the She's ride. my best. She's my best friend. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, so we are normally donating our money um, from our Patreon account to a local nonprofit. Um, I would like to also say that m maybe for the next week, we give the money to the, the nonprofit that you run. Um, oh, so you. if people come Sorry. on and they make a donation to us, we will pass that along. And, but we highly recommend they go directly to your site um, sure. because it really is, it's, it's, incredibly fun site as well because the cats are just ridiculous it's mm -hmm. uh orphankittyclub.org and there's a ton of information on it there is a even more of a ton of information on kitty lady or kitten lady Dot org um like a lot a lot a lot there's webinars you know you've got your shop and everything else that you're working on and i really love the calendar page so um oh. you know and that's a really easy way to support as well, I would assume, because you can. Yeah, I have two calendars year. coming out. At the, I mean, you can get them. You can order them now. They're like so cute. I just yep. got them in the mail and I can't stop looking at them. They're adorable. Yeah, they are really. <laughs> the, I mean, the photos on there are just unbelievable. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and obviously you can get your books uh, from from the from the site as well and you have a, a nice little merch shop with some really fun items on it including the uh, the salt girl takeoff and for those that don't want to spend a money a, a ton of money or don't have it you have some pretty awesome pins that I'm assuming are by some great artists as well so um, so yeah so thanks a lot and and just thanks for doing what you do it's really Thank it's like you. it's a bright spot in the very very you know strange 
time. So um, I am, I'm so happy I can provide that kind of happy moment to people. And that's why I've been just like, you know what the world needs is another duckling video today. And <laughs> For sure. You know what I'm going to do tonight? I'm going to go eat dinner and then uh-huh. I'm going to put the ducklings in the bathtub and I'm going to yep. take a video of it. And I'm going to post it on the internet because they need they need to do some indoor hey. pool time today. It was really smoky outside, so we're gonna do indoor pool, which nice. is the bathtub. But then it's yeah. like you know, I can share that joy with the internet, so people oh, can yeah, follow. post the video for sure. Yeah, people can follow on social media. My social media is just like at kitten x lady. Um, yep. You can go on there and see all my ducklings and my kittens. And is the x is the yeah. x a, uh, a, a, a call out for for straight edge or was that just random? Um, no, it is. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I've been awesome. for about as long as I've been vegan. So that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. But I don't think a lot of my cat people know that it's just, well, they would, I'm probably a lot of them wouldn't even know what it is. I mean, it's such yeah, a subculture of a subculture, well, right? It's a wink. Yeah. <laughs> yep. if you get it. You get it. <laughs> Having played in hardcore bands. I appreciate that. So I think it's Good. awesome. Yeah. So thanks for coming on. We really Thank appreciate you Hannah. And, for having me. Yeah. Great thanks time. for listening, everybody.